Who's good, who's not? Who's honest, who's not? Who's real, who's not? Who's telling the truth, who's fake, who's not fake? It's, it's completely confusing. You know, it's very hard to believe anything <laughs> that we're told. Who's the mole? Who's betraying us? What's going on? A world of mystery, uh, spy counter spy, uh, nothing is what it really, be, it really is. It's like an adult's version of cops and robbers. The wilderness of mirrors refers to this, this ultimate game that we're talking about. Well, this is kind of unusual development in television. Uh, the company was originally developed as a feature by John Calley and uh, with Ken Nolan, who wrote Black Hawk Down actually for Ridley years ago. In this case, the company was brought to me by a producer named John Calley, and uh, it was like a 900 page, 897 page book, and they said, can you read it over the weekend? And I was in Mexico with my wife at the time in Cabo San Lucas, and I did read it and pitched my take to John on Monday while I was in my underwear lying on the floor in my hotel in Cabo San Lucas. I just asked him, prevailed upon him, to read it and see if it was something that might engage his interest. I think he's a brilliant young filmmaker, a, fi a film writer, and will be a great filmmaker. I know Ken Nolan. I knew he'd been working on this project called The Company, and um, so I'd kind of been trying to keep abreast of it because I thought it was such a great, uh, it was a great book, and the book is long. and. Um, um, in fact, John Kelly had come to me way back when I, was, when I was doing another movie and saying, what about this? And um, uh, I'd, because I was so engaged in another film at the time, I'd said to John, look, you guys get it written, show it to me, and I will um, come on board. And I knew that Ken and Ridley had had a very successful collaboration on Black Hawk Down, and I thought the fact that Ken had written it might provoke Ridley to read it prior to committing to this other project. And I got it to him, and he did read it, and said that he would, he called and said he would like very much to do it. I thought it was absolutely wonderful, but it was lengthy. I think at the time it was about 180 pages, and um, it needed a director to come on board. And uh, so with that idea in mind of coming to do a feature film, John Kelly and I went to the studio and um, talked about making it into a film. I was very excited. I was also in transition from running the studio to becoming a producer. And my successor or successors were nervous about the budget implications of it. So after much diddling uh, and a great deal of patience on Ridley's part, they finally decided that they really didn't want to step up to what they thought the picture would cost. I think they thought it was going to be too expensive and it was to this, to that, and then I think there are also two other projects out at the time. My argument was we'll move so fast, we'll be faster out of the box than they will be. Um, we can guess what those projects were. I'm not gonna say what they were right now because I, like, I love being competitive, but they didn't. So here we are with, I think, a better version of that and a much more expansive version of that in the six hours. The construct of the novel um, is such that it fits perfectly into a miniseries format because it's written very episodically. It covers a broad, about four year period and, and you can break it down very conveniently into the Bay of Pigs segment. The Hungarian Revolution and so on. And so when the opportunity came to do it for TNT, what was most exciting for us was all the auspices involved on the feature side. Callie and Ken Nolan saw it as a great opportunity to really expand the story and fully exploit the novel to its greatest extent. One felt through the whole evolution of it that there was so much remarkable information that couldn't be dealt with, and it couldn't be dealt with in anything other than short staccato scenes that would be suitable for the big screen, but not do justice to it. This is um, a very dense book, a very articulate book, a very visual book, and it's kind of an embarrassment of riches. And I think what Ken Nolan did is he extracted the best and, and articulated a brilliant, brilliant screenplay. As far as I know, I was pretty faithful, faithful because Littell's dialogue is just incredible. I mean, if I could be half the writer Littell is, that would be an amazing thing. I mean, the guy, the way he describes a scene and describes a character, it's, it's stuff I never really have to do in screenwriting, and I wish I did, and so I had a chance to just extract a lot of his 
uh, description and dialogue from the book and put it into the script. And then everyone said, oh, you're so brilliant. I love the dialogue. And I went, oh, thanks. It requires the patience of a saint, which you, Harvey, do not have. Well, I'm here to tell you that I'm going to the director to put my case against your pal, Philby. Adrian Kim Philby is working for the KGB. The great opportunity you have in television is you can tell a much more detailed, much more layered story than you can in a feature film because we have more time to do it. Um, at least we have more screen time. We don't necessarily have more time to shoot it, but we have more screen time. And, and I, I love the original script. The writer, Ken Nolan, expanded it, took my art material from the book and added it to the script. So we, so it became a six hour. We were able to include a lot more than was in the original feature film. The only things that we ended up adding into the television version that Ken hadn't written some form of uh, for the film was the Hungarian Revolution, which didn't fit in there. And then the uh, final episode is greatly expanded from what we originally had. But the good news was that there was so much material Ken already had. And we had so much to work with, and the scripts and the feature form is already so strong that um, I could only look good, <laughs> whatever I contributed. People have seen thrillers and that sort of thing about the Cold War and about the CIA. This is unique in that it's done in a six-hour format. And there's three two-hour uh, films, really, that are all very different. Um, you know, you have uh, kind of an espionage thriller in the first couple hours. Colby is breaking him in as his future right-hand man. Leo's one of us. Well, the sorcerer conducts his own mole search in Berlin. I've conducted my own. The second couple of hours, you know, is a very big action piece. And the third hour itself is kind of a, a psychological thriller. It was just a... the brittle shell cracking under its own weight. <laughs> They're three very different um, pieces, but it, it it all wraps into the same story, and it's 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 an, a really interesting way to to tell a story. And I don't think you could have done that in just a straight two-hour movie. To me, I've always been intrigued by the CIA and and what they really do, and how things, how decisions are made, and what kind of um, what kind of sacrifices people have to make. And and again, the questions come up: of, uh, all these good things, do they really amount to to the right thing? Why do people join the CIA? I suppose for the adventure. I think you think you're gonna get into a life of spying and shooting people and drinking martinis and it turns out to be a lot more grim and brutal and disturbing and especially when you become emotionally attached to the people who are rising up against communism or trying to overthrow Cuba. You know, when you start to make those emotional bonds, then you see those people killed and before your eyes. I suppose being a CIA agent isn't that fun anymore. Isn't that glamorous? I think the Cold War was very dangerous, um, where people would just simply disappear. I think certainly, you know, one of the themes running through the, the story is that over the course of many years of working for the CIA, that um, you know that, that there's a certain amount of disillusionment that comes with you know with heroism. Jack, I mean, every character in the book was so well drawn that. I actually just had to leave things out a lot of the times. But um, in the book, Ebby goes to Budapest, and I thought, well, uh, following William Goldman's rules of screenwriting, you have to give the star everything. So I said Jack should go to Budapest, and it should all be Jack. I really wanted him to be a lonely guy who was sort of heartbroken by his time in the CIA. And in the book, he gets married. I can't remember if he has kids. I don't think he has kids, but I thought, he doesn't get married. He falls in love with Rainbow and he loses her and is is torn up about that for the rest of his life, you know. So I thought an unrequited love, it'd be a, a better character for Jack. The story of Lily and Jack is a very sad, pretty short, but intense love story. It's a story, a story of two persons who know that there is no chance for their love and um, that there's actually no point in falling in love with each other, but at the same time, they feel both feel that attraction and um, 
country defiant against it. I just thought, wouldn't it be great to make this guy sort of a hollow shell of a man by age 63 or whatever he ends up being? Jack is uh, someone who is very idealistic coming out of Yale and, and being recruited by the CIA. Very excited uh, going over to Berlin for his first assignment. Vizhnevsky. He hemmed and hawed his way through his biography. You put the screws down. God, Harvey, what, what do you have in that cooler, Slivovitz? The sorceress somehow represents the old way of doing it. When, when, before the CIA became the CIA, it was manned by kind of guys who were a little bit on the edge of things. They were they were very individualistic, a bit you know sort of a bit rebellious. They uh, they bent the rules when they thought it was necessary. They they weren't as well regulated or as or as um, corporate as it became. Harvey, you need to get some rest. No, I can't. I'm waiting for a phone call. From whom? I don't know whom, but my nose will twitch. And so he belongs to a kind of an older style of espionage. He has a protege, um, uh, Jack, the character that uh, Chris O'Donnell plays, who's a generation younger. And he, in a sense, represents the new CIA. The, the, you know, the guys that kind of went to when they, they went to university. They, 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 you know, they studied politics or world economics. They, they have a, they have a kind of intellectual, academic approach to the same job. We're not just looking for the best and the brightest. We're also looking for those who can handle extreme pressure and stress without wavering from their course. Now, there are no textbooks on spying. You make it up as you go along. Those of you who do not want to enter this world can leave now without embarrassment. To those of you who choose to stay, welcome to the company. Whereas Harvey belongs to a generation that were a bit sort of, a bit more rough and ready. Hello? You know, working with the sorcerer is very much an eye-opening experience, and, and I think that all the experiences he has, you know, in Berlin and, and Budapest. Bay of Pigs. He's kind of a loner. I mean, his, his family is actually Leo's family. You know, he's, he's married to his job. These are the events that really helped to shape him as a person. It's really about telling the story on both sides and the personal lives of these characters who actually try to function behind the Iron Curtain. Your professor, your supposed savior, has betrayed you. He works for the KGB. He's what we call a disinformation agent. It's an epic story framed by the relationships of the agents and the woman they touch along the way. Hungarian Revolution, uh, the invasion of the Bay of Pigs. Those are some of the big kind of canvases that we're seeking to reenact. Obviously, there is there is big a big landscape of events that are going on on a on a, on a bigger level. But you you forget and you wonder about what happened on the very front lines and, and to these people on a personal level. You know, the guys that actually had to follow out these orders and 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 you know make decisions that. They know they're doing it for the country, but they still affect you on a personal level, and that's uh, that's great for drama. Don't take away our dignity. It's the last thing we've got. 